George and Go. This is what we doing while we do it, baby. We roll Covering MMA from all over the world, this is the premier stop for all your combat sports needs. MMA Junkie Radio, the only show broadcasting live from the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino in the fight capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. The lights are on and the mics are hot. It's time to get your MMA fix, junkies. Take it away, Big John. Gorgeous George and Coach, are you ready? Junkie Nation, are you ready? Well, let's get it all. From the fight capital of the world, inside the beautiful Mandalay Bay Race and Sportsbook, you're listening to the MMA Junkie Radio Show, the only show that matters. I'm your host, Gorgeous George. With me, as always, is the devious and dastardly goes. Our East co-host, to my left, it's the fight analyst, Dan Tom. Back East producing, it's Gabby. Oh, I didn't know if you'd remember. And Josh is kind of like Robin, kind of hanging out on the side in case. Damn, you demoted him to Robin? Well, you know, that, that she's Batman tonight. Robin doesn't do nothing. Huh? Robin doesn't do Jack. Yeah, he does. Robin? Yeah, he's good uh, he's for He's always getting kidnapped. Well. Joker steals on his jaw all the time. But no, he's gotten a couple shots in. Old school Ra- uh, Batman and Robin, if there was the Joker and six of his henchmen, goons, mm-hmm. I'd say Batman took out four and the Joker, and Robin would contribute. Throw, get a couple out of Robin's best move yeah. was the double push Running kick. to the wall? Didn't he run off the wall? He would do that. But yeah. the reason he would always do that is because he would always get caught from behind in a bear hug. Yeah. And he had to kick someone like a kangaroo every single time. That was his best move. Well, she's the captain. He's the first mate. That's just the way it is Damn. tonight. So, uh, man, it's going to be a fun show. I'll tell you who we're going to have on. And then we're going to get to the hot news of the day. You all know which way we're headed with that one. But Henry Corrales, Bellator uh, featherweight, will be joining us. He's coming off that win over Aaron Pico. We talked about it a lot yesterday. Ryan Bader, who defeated Fedor Melianenko in the same card on the main event. He'll join us as well, top of the hour, uh, top of the second hour. Sorry, in the second hour. And then we have Joe Riggs and Beck Rawlings, both of them throwing down at the Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship 4 card out in Cancun uh, this Saturday. So you recall Chris Lytle was here recently. He's on that same card, and, and uh, you know, both of them have MMA backgrounds, so it'll be good to catch up with them, see how they're doing. All right. Now, the big news, obviously, is today the Nevada State Athletic Commission was uh, throwing down themselves. They were throwing some bombs. We all made our predictions of what we thought might go down. This is what went down. Habib Nurmagomedov has been ordered to pay a fine of 500000 Conor McGregor, 50000 You know they were still holding on to Habib's uh, purse this whole time? Yeah, and Conor's luckily they didn't he- hold on to his, right? Right, because they, they the only caught the footage later on when he actually had thrown a punch. But I think, you know, John Morgan will join us in a few minutes because he was there, so he knows all the ins and outs. But I think what, what Mark Ratner said a few weeks ago was right. If... Khabib doesn't jump over. Connor had kind of accepted his loss. If you'll recall, he's just kind of sitting there on his butt. And he had just gotten submitted. And, I mean, as we've seen before, when Connor loses, he, he loses. That's the end of the competition, all the trash talk, everything. He puts on his suit, then he comes out and tells you, you know, uh, how he's going to destroy his, his next opponent. But it just didn't happen. And that made me think that, he was on to something. But I, I just didn't think that they could get into this hearing and him come away unscathed. Yeah. So 50000 to uh, 500000 for Habib Nurmagomedov. Now, that's the fine portion. That's the fine portion. Nurmagomedov received nine months, while McGregor received six months. This is retroactive to October 6, 2018, when UFC 229 took place. That means that bo- uh, that... Connor would be able to fight on April 6th, as of April 6th. And you know there is a UFC pay-per-view on April 13th that doesn't have a headliner. Also, Habib would be eligible to return on as soon as July 6th. Something tells me that that date is before International Fight Week. I think. I don't know. The UFC has done the second week in July before, or sometimes they they saddle up to Independence Day. Mm-hmm. So, that remains to be seen. It, that one doesn't matter as much because Habib observes Ramadan, and Ramadan goes from early May to early June. So, I wouldn't see him on that card anyway. I just thought I'd bring it up. But, 
Habib has the ability to reduce his suspension to six months. And we'll get all that from John. But basically, there's a, they want him to participate in an anti-bullying campaign. And then there can be a three-month reduction. But, but it's got to be done right away. Mm -hmm. Now, how all this went down without them being there was this. I read this on Junkie yesterday. It looked like they are, were already doing some negotiating behind the scenes. And so all, all this was something we were – was lukewarm yesterday. We, you know, we found out that the camps, the attorneys on both sides – or, sorry, from both fighters versus NSAC had already started talking. Still, though, the, the, I think the big one was 500000 Wow, that's something else, isn't it? That is brutal. Yeah. That, uh, and for some reason, 250 sat in my head. Yeah, a quarter of a million. All right. And then playing off the $2 million purse – I thought 10%. Okay, 200,000, that might be it as well. Hell, 20,000 is 400,000. Sorry, 20% is 400,000. Still $100,000 less than what they gave them. There are very few people on the roster that even collect $500,000 as a purse. Some of them don't even make it in a year, two years. That's his fine. Mm -hmm. How crazy is that? Now, there was two other gentlemen involved in all this as well. Abukar Nurmagomedov. No, Abubakar, Nurmagomedov, and Zubaira Tukagov. They were each suspended one year for their roles in the melee because, well, I'm not sure what, how they arrived at that. doesn't make sense to me. That's what I want to ask John. I mean, yeah, because Nurmi jumped into the crowd. He started the whole thing. If right. he started it, how could his? Maybe they, could, maybe they have more time than money, like, like Frog from Colors. Because they got 25000 each, and by the way, Nermi's paying for everything. And there's attorney's fees rumored to be about 200000 So this thing's going to be a setback of seven hundred and fifty k approximately for Nermi when it's all said and done. But he's going to scoop up that money. Maybe they got more time than money, and that's mm -hmm. why they did it that way. But, yeah. Go ahead. What were you saying? Well, now actually, now that you say that, that does kind of make sense. Maybe that was the way they looked at it. But uh, to me, it doesn't make sense. How does the person that started get less time? Than the guys that jumped in, I don't, I don't understand. Maybe because they just hit them harder with the the pocketbook Maybe. is all I can think of. All right, well, John Morgan will call in and we'll ask him a little bit more about that. Another thing that went down was John Jones. Is, is John ready to go? Uh, no. Oh, no. Okay. Well, we just hang loose, or what? What was that sign? Uh, there's a caller that wants to weigh in on the oh, whole here. Call well, that caller can wait. I wonder what he thinks of that. Uh, yeah, we'll get to you, caller. And if you want to follow that caller, it's 877-FIGHT-93. But you're going to have to wait, too. All right. So John Jones was also in attendance, or was in attendance. He, he was on the docket, I should say. And he has been cleared. He's going to get a one-fight conditional license to compete at UFC 235. So he gets to defend his title against Anthony Smith. Now, as a condition for his licensure, Jones must submit to and pay for additional drug drug testing, excuse me, by the Nevada State Athletic Commission over the next 40 days or until the March 2nd pay-per-view event. Now, remember, that will be in addition to USADA, which is what regulates all of the UFC athletes. I mean, I think he'll take that, right? He's, he's basically said, minus the picograms, I'm clean, come keep te testing me. So, but, but he gets to fight in Vegas and the card is on. Right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm pretty sure you'll take that. We have John Morgan ready? We do. All right. John Morgan from MMA Junkie joining us now on the hotline. What's up, John? It's been a long day. <laughs> I don't know how you kept your attention, that light bulb blinking that whole time, dude. <laughs> yeah, it was tough, man. The, uh, the John Jones stuff, of course, ended up being the bulk of the hearing today. Uh, you know, Connor and Habib had everything done there, but the the deals were done by the time the, the meeting started. So that was a very quick portion of it. Uh, but the, the, the drawn-out discussion on John Jones certainly was uh, uh, it, it, it was a grind. There's no question about it. Some important stuff being talked about, it, but some very specific, very scientific stuff as well. It gets a little tedious at times. John, whose idea was it for them to start the pre-negotiations, whether it was 24 hours before or whenever, before the hearing? Well, that's something that we knew was going to happen all along. I mean, first of all, you know, neither one of those guys, Habib or Connor, necessarily wants to travel to be here in Las Vegas. They don't have to. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's expensive for them to do it. It takes time away from, from you know, where they are. 
Uh, so neither one of them really wanted to do it. So, I mean, I think we always kind of knew along the way that this was probably going to be like the conclusion. As long as everybody could get on the same page and, and find an agreement that they, uh, that they felt comfortable with. And both parties did. You know, I think, I think Habib was a little less comfortable with the 500000 but um, you know, from the numbers that we've heard that he made off the paper B revenue, you know, I wouldn't call it a chop in the bucket, but uh, you know, it was it was worth it for him to just kind of get things done and move forward. I just think back to the days where Anderson would have to fly from Brazil, or you know, them Diaz brothers. They don't like to hop on a plane and do something they don't want to do. And when I saw it last night, I go, well, good for them if they're power players like that, you know, and and they can basically just make a call or send the fax or do what whatever it takes, you know, sign, uh, do do the electronic signatures and. And that's that, but uh, yeah, I, I was just thinking about how the sport just kind of changes. You know what I mean? In, in all regards. No, definitely, it's evolved over time. I mean, things did used to play out a lot more in a public forum. And to be honest with you, I think most people realize that's not necessarily the best way for things to play out. Uh, you know, when they can get together behind the scenes and, and make things work. Don't forget, uh, you know, Mike Mersh, uh, who used to work for the UFC, is actually Conor McGregor's attorney. So obviously, he has a, a fantastic relationship with the commission there, and he can make things happen. And uh, you know, there's representatives for Habib as well. So, uh, yeah, you know, it just I think it makes sense. If it behooves everybody to, if they can get together behind the scenes and, and shake things out, it's easier to do it there. What were those rumors? Is that something that you were told off the record, or is, did I miss a story out there of what you said, that, of what Habib may have taken down uh, from that pay-per-view? Uh, well, no, no, no stories. Just things preferred behind the scenes and then having some conversations with people. So I don't remember actually seeing any numbers floated out there. Of course, as you know, the the uh, the numbers aren't aren't necessarily on record and, and aren't necessarily publicly reviewable. Okay. But, um, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't take a genius to do the math and realize he did pretty well for the he made more than five hundred thousand. That's for sure. Yeah, because I, I had heard obviously seven figures, but not much north of that. But when you are making that much money, I, I suppose. What you want to do is get on with it. So if you start any form of negotiation with them where you don't have to appear, you agree on a number, yeah, it might hurt. Plus, you're already let, letting them keep $2 million of it while all this gets sorted out, sorted out. The rumors I heard must have been pretty true. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, because that, that, that comes from pay-per-view, and I don't think that's withheld. That's just from, from promoter to uh, fighter. So I, I'm just glad it's done. And... I mean, MMA is definitely growing up. Lots of money's being thrown around, and good on Habib. You know, yet another athlete aside from Connor to to be making these paydays. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, look, he was a big part of the equation, right? I mean, uh, it, it, yeah, Connor was massive in it, but he was instrumental in making it to sell as well. So, you know, I, I think it's good that he cashed in. It's just a shame, you know, that it ended the way it did. I really think that hurt his star power moving forward. And I think this was a big hit, and you know. To be honest, he might have to face Conor McGregor again at some point, basically because he jumped over the fence. I don't think people would have wanted a rematch had it not been for that. So, uh, you know, shame the way things played out, but it's good that it looks like we're trying to. Today, give me your thoughts. Did that shock you at all? Were you or excessive? I mean, I thought it was going to be more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars range, so I still thought I thought it was going to be significant. I didn't think there was any way he was getting unfazed. I mean. We just can't have fighters leaping the cage and, and putting people at risk. I mean, you can't have fights spilling over into the audience. There's no question about that. So I thought for sure $250,000 would be, you know, a guarantee. But yeah, I, even I thought $500,000 was a, a little bit stiff. You know, and, and conversely, it's kind of funny, you know, $50,000 for Conor McGregor, I mean, that's certainly a drop in the bucket for him. We know what he made it, it with Floyd Mayweather, but I honestly didn't think he deserved much at all. I mean... As bad as I thought what Connor did, you know, back in, in, in the bus incident in Brooklyn, I mean, as wrong as I thought he was for that, and as much as I think he kind of got off fairly easily for what happened there, I didn't think he really did much wrong in this situation. I mean, he was, you know, when people start jumping into the playing surface, so to speak, I mean, I think you've got to have a right to defend yourself, to be honest with you. I mean, how, how are you supposed to, after just going through four rounds of a championship fight, quickly evaluate what the danger level and what the threat level is and that sort of thing. And, and you know, I, I think you kind of got a right to defend yourself. So, to be honest with you, I was a little surprised that it was even that much, even though $50,000 is nothing to Conor McGregor. Um, I was surprised that it was even that much. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I think a suspension. Well, I guess maybe they just had to do something and they, they wound up picking 10% of what they gave Habib. But, yeah, I guess when you break it down, it was in the field of play. It was chaos, mayhem. You didn't know from who was who at that particular moment, or what they, you know, what they were doing. 
Uh, and plus, in the state he was in, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. He wasn't with a clear head. I get what you're saying. Um, all right, nine months and six months, and those nine months can be reduced to six months. Uh, I'm kind of happy to hear that, to tell you the truth, because, look, I think we're halfway there or, or maybe 60% of the way there, and that April date is cleared for Habib to fight. That April 13th date, they're supposed to have a pay-per-view. before. So then that, that could get Habib a fight with t Tony Ferguson, I'm hoping. Or if they run it back with Connor, okay. But, you know, we, we get to see the champ defend before he observes Ramadan, which starts on May 5th and ends June 6th, I believe. And and then he could come back and fight again in, in late 2019. I don't want to wait a whole year and hold up this division. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's awfully hopeful, man. I, I like your optimism. I like where your head's at, but, but I'm not sure. I mean, uh, there's already been some rumblings that, you know, uh, Habib's cornermen were uh, were suspended for a full year, and that you know he said he's going to stand in solidarity with them, and because you know because they're suspended a year, he's not going to fight until until they're not really? made that clear from the beginnings. Yeah, you know the the man of principle who said you know if Zubair Tuigov is, is released from the UFC, you know I'm not fighting either. So it, you know it sounds like he's standing in solidarity with the team. It also sounds like he's he's, he's uh, told uh, Ali Abdelaziz he doesn't want to fight in Nevada anymore. Um, so we'll see. We don't know where that April date is. But, I mean, I, look, I thought the same thing. Trust me. You look at the, you, you know, you look at the calendar and you say, well, that's probably the first time he could fight. And then, as you said, Ramadan is right after that, so it's kind of a self-imposed sanction after that. So I'm actually kind of interested if he, if he even does the PSA at this point. I mean, I don't know if he has any, if, if he really cares about getting it from nine months to six months. I, I don't know if it really benefits him at all. So I'm kind of interested to see if he even bothers following through with it. I told George the same thing. I wouldn't be shocked if he didn't do it. And that leads me to this question, John, and this is just going to be you speculating, but I know you've talked to me plenty of times. Does he regret any of this? Because, yeah, it's a hefty fine. There's a suspension. But really, that guy has always talked about his principles and what he stands for. And if he really believes what he did was right, then they can pretty much find him whatever I don't know that he's going to. I don't know that he still stands there. Maybe uh, different as some other fighters that actually show some regret for what they did. I think he feels bad of the way it played out, but I don't know that he would change it. Well, what do you think? I I tend to agree with you there, girls. I mean, as you said, it's, it's pure speculation. But yeah, we've talked to all parties involved, and I don't think he regrets it at all. You know, again, maybe he regrets the fact that his teammates got involved when, when maybe he felt like they didn't need to be. You know, maybe he thought that something that he could handle on his own. It was a message that he wanted to send on his own. Um, you know, again, it's, it, we've heard that he really doesn't need to fight again financially if he doesn't want to, that, he, that he's doing just fine. Um, and I think he believes he proved a point. So, yeah, and I, I don't mean that as a negative thing. I'm not trying to say, you know, uh, you know, he's a bad guy, which is kind of what I hate because, I mean, you and I, you, we've, we've been following his career for so long, man, and this, you know, this incident does not adequately re re reflect who he is as a person, but it's going to be the incident that most people know him from, which I find to be a shame. But, yeah, to be honest with you, I, I, in this in this instance, I, I don't think he feels remorse or anything other than, you know, the way it played out and the fact that he didn't get to enjoy his, you know, having the belt wrapped around him in the cage and, and that sort of thing. I mean, I think that's all that I think that's all that matters to him. I don't, I, I don't think he would change a thing. So what do we do as fans? Should we start petitioning for the UFC to move on then? I mean, if he's not taking much interest in – you know, fighting in Nevada or fighting till his guys are cleared or fighting Conor McGregor, teasing Floyd Mayweather, not giving Tony his chance. We got, I mean, well, this is a division that's got Tony ready to go. And after him, Dustin's ready to go. You know what I mean? And Conor's such a big star that he's ready to go at any time. And I guess we'd all stomach it because of what, what he just brings, you know, to uh, MMA, to the UFC, to the lightweight division. So what do we do? What do you, what do you think happens? I mean, is he is he that big of a star that the UFC will just write it out then? And when Habib's ready to go, he's ready to go. Are we sure we didn't strip Tony Ferguson? Maybe we just bring that interim belt back out, you know, put it on a poster or something. You know, you know. Look, I, I don't know. I mean, look, if Habib can fight in a year, that's not the worst thing. I mean, we've had longer layoffs, right? So I don't know that you necessarily need to bring out an interim championship. But you're right. I don't necessarily want the whole division hanging around. I mean, you look at the names that are up there. You mentioned, you know, Ferguson, Poirier, heck, I Quinta has, has been in there wanting a big fight lately. Um, you know, I, I don't know what fight makes the most sense for Conor. I think stylistically, you got to be real careful with that right now. But um, yeah, you know, I, I think we'll get a chance to talk to, to, to the UFC president Dana White at the press conference on Thursday night. And while I know we'll be there to talk about UFC 235, you know, I don't see how you can't bring this up and, and ask about it and see where you stand.
Um, hopefully the division does continue to move forward to at least some degree in, in uh, Habib's absence, especially, you know, I guess that's where, the, where it would come in from the UFC perspective. If he was suspended for a year, you know, you may say, hey, we'll just ride it out, no big deal. If he's suspended for six months and he's saying, nah, I'm not fighting for a year because that's the way I feel about it, then you, you would have a right to strip him. You would have a right to, to create inner title because your champion isn't willing to defend. I, I agree with what you guys are saying. I'm glad George mentioned, you know, Tony Ferguson, who er, already earned a belt, never lost the said belt that he earned. So I think it's, yeah, needless to say, his, his next fight needs to be for a belt. But I think it's going to tell us a lot as far as, you know, where maybe uh, – Khabib's negotiating power stands. I'm not sure what you think on that, John, because not you know different circumstances, obviously, between John Jones, UFC 232, and all his ongoings. But as far as as far as if we're talking about you know a guy's pull, and kind of to your point, um, not only would that be the right move for the fans, but perhaps that would give the UFC some leverage to say, hey, you're at that one year mark. You know what that means? That's about chopping time, and maybe they can use that uh, as far as leverage to maybe getting getting him to take a match. Yeah, I think so. Like I said, I mean, if he had been suspended for a year and the UFC came back and automatically stripped him of his title, I don't know that I would stand in support of that because he said, well, listen, he definitely made a boneheaded decision, but, man, look at all the emotion that was involved in this. Look at everything that was there. Uh, you know, we'll let that slide. But for, for, you know, the commission to say, hey, you can fight as soon as April, and him to say, nah, I'm good. I need another six months past that. I, I believe it absolutely does open up a, a realm of possibilities for the UFC to to justly come in and say, hey, this is how we're going to handle this. We're going to strip you or, or we're going to bring the interim title back out or, or whatever the case may be. And I think they'd be kind of, you know, more in the right there than they would be in not because the champion is essentially refusing to defend. Also, just to add to that point, because of the said division, lightweight, obviously a rich history since its inception of mess-ups and, and hurdles and hang-ups, which fans, and i got to imagine the promotion is sick of. And also as well, uh, Khabib's history himself, like you said, John, is he's not a bad guy, but when you incorporate all the history from whether it's uh, salacious history that we're talking about in the hearing now, or let's 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 we not forget, they've always had a tr he's always had trouble coming to the dance, not just against Tony Ferguson, not just for title fights, not just for interim title fights. Even back in the day when they were trying to give him number one bump me over spots against Cowboy Cerrone on huge Memorial Day cards here, and he wasn't able to make those dates either. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, you really can't bring all that in. And, and again, it's not an attack on his character. Right. It's just a matter of, hey, you know, just because you say you're coming back in October, we appreciate where you're but, but we can't even guarantee you're going to be back in October because, you know, we've seen things happen before. So, yeah, that's why I say, I mean, you really you couldn't blame the UFC for, for taking another direction if, if this is what, you know, Habib is going to kind of dig his heels in the sand and, and insist on doing. I want to see Habib fight. No Me problem. Me too. But yeah. if he's not going to. For whatever reasons, I'll respect that. But I just think the sport, the division, it has to move along. And I see the way they acted with Woodley. Woodley defended his belt against Till in September. He had an injury, which was documented. But then I remember Dana White saying, either way, Usman's fighting on March 2nd. That left it open for either Covington or Woodley. So mm -hmm. it was a little bit of pressure on Woodley there. And he had an injury. This other guy actually got in trouble. <laughs> yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, there's, they, they've had a, a, a weight mishap. Uh, and then thinking back to – I know Pettis was out for over a year where he didn't defend, and I believe Connor had the same thing. He went through 18 months, uh, 12 months before they did the interim, 18 months before they actually said, you're not even the undisputed anymore. And, again, this is a talent-rich division. Yes. It just – that that can't be happening. You know what I mean? Uh, anyway. There's so much drama involved in this situation. Yeah. Like, I honestly – I don't think he's doing the PSA. What do you think? Well – uh, yeah, I think I think at some point somebody will go, bro. That's oh, wait, that, that's that only reduces it three months, right? Right. Oh no, he's not doing it then. D yeah. Dan, do you think he'll do it? Uh, yeah, I, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. John? <laughs> no, I don't, man. At first, I was like, <laughs> this is a great idea. Then when I realized, <laughs> no, nah, I don't think he's gonna do it. Well, here here's what makes things interesting for me. I wish I could hear the conversation between Dana White and Ollie mm. because how many times has the shoe been on the other foot where it's kind of like, look, Ollie. You get fighter A to maybe do this, take this fight on short notice. Maybe we'll help you out with fighter B and fighter C. Now it's a different situation where I think if you're on that roster, that dominance roster, you're praying he does that PSA because you don't want to find out you got sent to Australia or wherever because your other guy didn't cooperate. I don't know, man. I think that can get kind of – I think Ali will be in a tough spot now. Yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. Good point. Know. All right, last thing here, John Jones. He got uh, a, a one-fight license. He's cleared for UFC 235 on March 2nd. There's some additional testing per the Nevada State Athletic Commission. 
I, I think I, I, after what we found out, you know, him being cleared by CSAC, him fighting, the picogram being consistent, but being uh, everybody's stomached it for, for the most part, uh, we're just ready to go with it, right? I mean, that, I don't think there was anything too shocking uh, on, on Jones's behalf. No, it wasn't. You know, I, I thought, to be honest with you, uh, that the NSAC handled this very well. They said, listen, we want to see repeated tests moving forward. Um, we want to make sure that those picogram levels don't rise. You know, we understand there's going to be some fluctuation, but we want to make sure they don't rise too much. But what I thought was, was really great uh, that Nevada did today was they took a stand and, and they brought up the, the, the two tests that USADA did that they did not pass on to the California State Athletic Commission before their hearing against John Jones. You know, when that whole thing happened, and, and the whole event got moved out to, to L.A., um, you know, I think we all kind of understood, all right, well, this is why it's being done, and, you know, it's, it's a little odd, but yet. And then towards the end of the week, we found out, oh, by the way, um, there were two extra tests that USADA had that they never passed on to the CSAC. And uh, a USADA rep got up there today and, and, and basically, um, I, I thought, it gave a poor showing of himself, if I'm being perfectly honest, and said, you know, well, here's what our reasons. We didn't think that... Uh, you know, those fell under the California state guidelines. You know, that was not their jurisdiction at the time, which just seems absolutely ridiculous when you consider that he was under suspension and they were reviewing his case. Um, and, and I don't think that those tests really showed anything too, too different than what we, we've seen already. But USADA admitted that they were trying to figure things out as well, and so they kept some information. Uh, Nevada called out USADA on that. Uh, Andy Foster was actually watching the stream and texted in to, to debate a point that was being made. Uh, he texted to Bob Bennett, so it was clarified. So I was really proud of the way they handled that. Um, I, you know, I do believe in drug testing. I do believe um, there are benefits to it. But we need it to be as clear as possible. We need 100% clarity, and I don't think that's what we always have with USADA. And then it gets convoluted when you're talking about Nevada, when you're talking about California. Um, and, and they took a stand today to say, listen, um, that is garbage, and that cannot be the way we operate moving forward, and we've got to get this rectified. So I thought that was a great part. I think what they did with John Jones is right as day. Hey, let's do this fight, and then let's keep testing you for the rest of 2019, and we'll keep watching you test. We want you tested at least twice a month for the rest of 2019, and then we'll go from there. So I thought great stuff uh, there. The other issue point you guys will have time to talk about later, I'm sure, but Nevada also said, that they want to kind of start regulating what guys say. This goes back to the Habib and, yeah. and Connor situation that they want people being held accountable for their actions in the lead up to a fight. That's going to be a slippery slope. That's going to be tough to, to enforce, but I thought it was an interesting point uh, for people to be aware that that's something that Nevada wants to get involved in. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up with the uh, – I didn't see the testimony, but I was reading about that and, and, and how the interaction with the the, uh, the California State Athletic Commission. So I guess – I don't know if this is too unfair of a generalization question to ask you, John, but – uh, just you know, your takeaway from today as a whole. Do you feel maybe that you would you would you say silver lining here? The commission's, you know, whether you agree with the outcomes or not, came off well. And the fact that they really stressed their thorough and due diligence. And would you say that maybe USADA came off not as good? Uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty good characterization of it. To be honest with you, uh, you know, I you know I don't think USADA's entire reputation took a big hit, but I do think it, it was. You know, for them, to, for everybody to think they're this perfect, you know, infallible organization, I think people saw the day that, no, you know, they made mistakes and judgment calls that deserve to be questioned as well. Don't just take everything they do as 100% perfect. And, and yeah, I do think Nevada today made some solid statements. I, I, I honestly am happy with the way they handled it. As somebody who's attended, you know, hundreds of these commission meetings, it, it's been a while since we had one of this link. Um, and, and while it's, a little, like I said, a little tedious at times, I do think they, they handled themselves pretty well. I'm, I'm pr pretty proud as a Nevada resident of the way our commission handled themselves today. So um, I, hopefully there will be some moves in the right direction for everybody involved. John, one more quick one for me. Did did Dylan Dennis offend uh, Habib in regards to religion and his father, or did that all come from Connor? I, I think that all came from Connor, to be honest with you. I, I You know, I, I – I, I, struggle sometimes to recall exactly what Dylan Dennis has written or said because we know it's all just a big act uh, and, and we know that right. um, you know he's definitely trying to rile people up so I, I struggle for it to register maybe sometime as like some deep fact or what have you but um, yeah I think it was mostly Connor to be honest with you mm, okay all right my man thanks so much for joining us here and clearing a few things up we appreciate it as always no worries anytime guys all right we'll see you that's John Morgan follow him on Twitter at MMA Junkie John. 
All right, we got to take a break. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM Fight Nation Channel 93. Stay close. We'll be right back.
defeated Aaron Pico in what was one of the most uh, amazing fights that I've seen in person in terms of crowd atmosphere, it going back and forth. And even though it all went down so quickly in just over a minute, I mean, it had a lot, guys. I talked about it a lot on yesterday's show. And the post-fight speech was epic. There wasn't much to it, but it was to the point. Who the fuck is next is what Henry <laughs> Corrales was saying after he defeated Hen uh, Aaron Pico. Well, we're going to ask him. He's joining us now on the hotline. What's up, Henry? How you doing? What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Man, you're a gangster. Straight up. I don't know what other way to put it. That was an awesome performance. I like your little intro you had. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, it's really what I felt. I came back here and I told the guys, I drove from Vegas to L.A. five hours, you know, with traffic. Halfway through, I'm like, why, why am yeah. I doing this? I could just watch it at home on zone or Paramount. But when I got there and I saw the atmosphere and what you two went out there and did, it was all worth it. And the main event hadn't even happened yet, you know. But you guys really, really delivered. You got the better hand. Uh, he got you early, but but you, you gutted it out and, and then dropped him and iced him, you know, with a follow-up. That was very, very impressive against a tough guy in Aaron Pico. Thanks, man. Yeah, the crowd was electrifying for sure. Who man, I'm telling you. And you know when John McCarthy was interviewing you, you still had this glazed look on your face. And I don't know if you were still in primal mode or or were you still kind of clearing the cobwebs like as you were looking up and he was kind of telling you, "Hey, he got you early and you weathered the storm and you came back." C did you know exactly what had happened or was it all like a car collision like were, were bells still were you still still seeing stars? No, no, I was just in killer mode, you know, I was, the adrenaline was still high, and uh, I was just, uh, I didn't want to celebrate too much, you know, he, he got, we had a lot of mutual people that were cool with in the crowd, so, yeah. you know, I was just trying to just keep, keep it cool, you know, the guy's young, he just got fucking killed pretty bad, so I was just out of respect, you know. Yeah. Did you feel like going into the fight, because of his popularity, because of all the, you know, all the promise that this kid has showed that... I don't know if they were serving him up like, you know, you, you being a stepping stone. I mean, you're a veteran who's got a lot of wins. You had 16 wins going into that fight and, and only the three losses. So much respect there. But but did you feel it like that that was the case? It was a showcase for him? Um, Yeah, that definitely that was the case for sure. But, uh, you know, I've been labeled a lot worse than an underdog or whatever. So, fuck it, I don't really care. And, uh, you know, 13 of my 17 wins are by finishes, so I know what I'm about, you know. I'm not too too worried about that type of stuff. Right. And there's some good names in there, you know. We, we went over this when we were breaking down the card. Uh, Georgie Karakanyan held a major belt at one point. He was a WSO def champion, you know, and Aaron Pico's a solid fighter. Andy Main, Noah Lahat. I mean, we've seen these guys in and around the sport. So you're on a nice streak. Do you think this propels you? to a possible title shot. Is that what you want at this point? Because not only did you get a win over a tough guy, but you got buzz. Everyone's talking about Henry Corrales right now. Thanks, man. Yeah, I would think so, for sure. You know, uh, there was a lot of title ratification talk before the fight went down, and so I don't see why there wouldn't be no talk about it after the fight, especially the way I finished it. So it'd be definitely, it'd be nice to get back into a pit bull dude and mix it up with that guy. You know, last time I fought him, it was like 12 days notice, you know, and uh, it'd be cool to get in there with the full camp with that guy. Mm -hmm. And at this stage of my career, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm on a, I'm just operating on different frequency these days at the, with the MMA lab, so it'd be a lot different going down this time for sure. What would you call this stage of your career, Henry? Let's compare it to football, four quarters. You're 32 years old. You've got almost 20 fights. Uh, is it the third quarter? Are you still in the second quarter? Are you in the final stages? I feel like uh, I'm always shocked in this sport. Some guys go to like, you know, 48. Like I think Dan Henderson recently yeah. did that. And then others are like, you know, Dennis Bermudez was just on our show. And I think he, he just retired at 32. Where do you sit? Uh, for me, you know, I just feel like I entered my physical prime like maybe a year ago. But I'm barely scratching the surface on my mental prime. You know what I mean? Being older, you know, and uh, just being more just conscious and uh, present and aware of a lot more things that are going down in my life is just making everything better, you know. And uh, I'm, at, I'm in a good place, dude, and I'm just, I'm just ready to take everything to the next level, man. So you just ran out of the tunnel. It was just halftime right now, and you still got 20 more fights in you, it sounds like. 
Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Crowell is our guest here on the MMA Junkie Radio Show. He's coming off that big win over Aaron Pico at Bellator 214. That was a KO finish. First round, look it up, folks. Seriously, that whole minute and seven is what MMA is all about. All right, let me turn it over to the fight analyst, Dan Tom. Dan, what do you have for Henry Kraus? Hey, uh, Henry, first off, aside from uh, obvious congratulations, um, I, I got to ask you, I, I know I, I heard the story of how you got your nickname, o o OK. Okay, there for Okay Corral, that's Okay Corral. But uh, as far as a uh, walkout song, is, was that your usual jam that you walk out to? And if so, is there uh, maybe a story behind it? Oh, that's my jam, dude. Some shit on mine. Blood runs cold. Uh, just a, some old school heat right there, you know. Uh, some uh, just some jams from some crazy times for me. Yeah, I've walked out to that song a couple times. Right, right on, man. I, I first time I heard Jedi Mind Tricks was uh, actually in Southern California when I was hanging out with some friends there. Ironically enough, and uh, speaking of your old, uh, older days, I guess there, uh, you know, you also recently shared a, a story, or at least in your post-fight uh, interview, you shared a story about uh, you know being stabbed and, and fighting off a guy with your skateboard. And that story is great and all, but as a skateboarding guy, I got to know, Henry, who 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 are the skate? Did you skate for long? And if so, who are your favorite skateboarders, man? Oh, dude, I grew up on a skateboard, you know, from from the moment I could start. Like, when I was five years old, I was skating all the way until, like, until a fucking booze and puss took over, and I stopped skating, but <laughs> for a good, good kid, like, good 14 years. And uh, I guess I guess back back in those days, I like a lot of the street skaters, you know, like, just that's a lot of cool tricks. Yeah, I, was, uh, I, I like the... Uh Guys like Rodney Mullen and Day Wong Song, technical guys, street guys. So uh, sick. Yeah. You know what's up. Yeah. All right. So I guess from the – so obviously from the skating to, to fighting, whether it be in the streets to when you, you know, harnessed it more in the martial arts and now you're making a career off it, it is, is it safe to say that just, you know, the, this calm, coolness that we're getting from you, is this something that you've always had? Kind of uh, you could do adrenaline high things but always kind of keep a, keep a cool head? Yeah, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, you know, the only reason why I share those stories is because, you know, it's not to, like, brag about past or anything, you know, it's just, just to give martial arts the credit, you know, for, for helping change, change my life around, you know, and give me some purpose and give me more life, you know, that's, that's kind of why I share those things, but, uh, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty chilled out, pretty, pretty level, pretty level-headed. Yeah, especially now that I'm getting a little bit older and stuff for school, but that wasn't always the case for sure. A little, little bit of a handful in my early days. Well, yeah, to, to, to your credit, and obviously, like you're saying, to martial arts credit, I think the maturity speaks for itself. Now, obviously, you got a first-round stoppage just last weekend, but people that have been following uh, following your career and watching your fights, what impresses me the most is, is again, kind of that calm, cool collectiveness where things can happen bad in a fight, but you're never discouraged, and you keep going. And I actually am more impressed with the guys that get their finishes in the second or third rounds um, in the fights. And if you actually look at uh, Henry's record, your record, Henry, uh, people will see that that's where you, you get a lot of your finishes. So I guess uh, taking this question somewhere, ra rounding it to to a name you mentioned, uh, you know uh, uh, the, the the champ uh, Patricio Fiete getting that rematch. Um, one thing I, I, I see interesting is not only do you have that composure, but something I said, and I'll be honest, I, I picked the other way. I I, I, I picked uh, I, I picked Pico in our staff picks, but I did say that man Henry hasn't been stopped. He I've seen this guy get his his T smash in the first round and just come back and fight like nothing happened and fights get real interesting if you don't have if you don't have a, a solution for Henry Corrales so am I am I am I am I wrong by saying that and, and how does that how does your evolution now play into to how you see a rematch going with with, with Patricio no you're right you know I I'm a bit of a sicko dude like I I daydream about like uh being injured and pushing through fights and pushing through pain like uh that's part of uh, that's part of the, that's part of the process, dude. I don't just think about the glory of the fight, you know. I think about bleeding, you know. I think about nasty shit, and so when it happens, I'm just like, yeah, whatever. <clears throat> Let's go, keep going, you know. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just super grateful that you know, I'm just I'm fighting one guy who's my size. They're gonna throw some money at me, you know. Nobody's jumping in. There's no weapons involved. And it's all good, so <laughs> let's, let's go from the back. From back. Now, baby, let's get it. <laughs> so true. No one gets to jump in, man. That's it. Now, Henry, 
I don't know if you saw the fight, but another thing I observed, your corner went nuts. John, Benson, a few others. <laughs> they yeah. were going berserk. Almost like almost like they were gonna jump in and, and fight themselves, you know, like I mean, well, you know, it's to be expected. I was in media row, and I had to contain myself because we're not supposed to show any emotion at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I stood up because I was like, wow, I couldn't believe what had just happened. I had to sit back down. Um, but, but I mean, I, I'm relaying all this to you because I, I, I want you to know just how great the fight was. The other day, J Jake Hager, yesterday Jake Hager was on our show. And he had gotten a lot of love from WWE, uh, some of you know the, the, his f former colleagues, on just how great he did. And I wanted to do the same thing. I observed a lot of people. I talked to a lot of people. I actually sat with John Moraga at Royal Rumble the next day, and he said, that's my dog. You know, oh, hey, hey, hey. We were talking about you as well. Hey, hey, hey. He was proud of you. John was proud of you. Benson, the media was talking about you. I mean, uh, seriously, it, it was your night, and uh, it was a great night, and I, I hope you – I hope you uh, enjoyed it, like, you know, as such as, you know, because it was really, really epic for you, man. Dude, it was, man. And that, that means so much to me because, dude, don't get me wrong, dude. It, like, getting my hand raised for sure plus my ego and it makes me feel really good. But there's nothing like your buddies and your family and just, they're all pumped up and they're like, dude, you can see their drilling going and they're fucking calling you and texting you and fucking grabbing you for a picture after the fight. And, you know, that for me, that's what it's all about, dude. That, that's, that's what really gets me all jazzed up. Well, you delivered, my man. And congratulations on that win, and, and thanks for spending some time with us here on the show. Hopefully that does net you a shot at the champ. Uh, we'd love to see you guys run it back. And if not, then we look forward to covering your next fight. And uh, thanks for the time again. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. All right, Henry. Take care. All right, that's Henry Corrales. Follow him on Twitter, at Henry Corrales 86 Just for this one fight, man, they should have nicknamed him Henry K.O. Corrales. Yeah. That was something else, I'm telling you. I, I, if you haven't heard yesterday's <laughs> show or, or you go back and listen, I tried to describe it as best as I could because it was one of those it was one of those fights that just went in so many different directions. You know what it felt like, Danton? Like a bank robbery. You know what I mean? Like a bad guy came in and started slapping people around, then it was a quick gunfight and you know, I, I, it was something else. It, the old Lee it, it Murray. Really, it really was something else. It was quick and violent. and Yeah, anyway. All right, we got to take this last break. It's the last break of the first hour. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 93. Uh, we'll be right back. A shout-out to Goes for lining up the Henry Corrales interview.
Championship four in Cancun. Not each other. Life doesn't suck, right, for them? Yeah. Fighting Cancun. Get a payday. Get to sock somebody up. And then you get to chill in Cancun. Uh, Chris Lytle's on the same card as well. And then, of course, Bader, man. God. I, uh, I was doing some rankings homework today. And I'll tell you guys where he wound up. I, I put him right below. Actually, it was a six, six to wow. ten range. Wow. Okay, it was nice. A six to ten Look range. That. I had there to was put no him way around it. In front of Whitaker and behind. Uh, well, I'll look it up. I think Woodley or somebody like that. Or Cejudo, sorry. Cejudo seven, yeah, and Whitaker bumped to nine. And so oh. Bader moves from 13 to eight. You know, um, but, you know, it, it's good to be him. He's got three belts now. I mean, he's, mm -hmm. he possibly is Bellator GOAT at this moment. In their 10-year history, what he's accomplished has been pretty amazing. He's on an incredible run, and so we'll talk to him as well. Uh, Corrales is still harnessing, you know, that that adrenaline. I mean, it looked yeah. like he was pretty pumped up, or maybe him talking to us, Dan, was was getting him pumped up. But that that's what I'm talking about in terms of, like, you know, I, I didn't see too much of what his pre-fight was like, but when your fight delivers, get out there, you know what I mean? Yeah. Give it another few days, a week of more media and get people talking and that, that's that's why you know those guys huddle up guys and gals that do the matchmaking and you know the executives at, at with all these promotions they talk about what's popping google alerts trends social media you know who's blowing up and then they make this final decision and you can you can really really build off a huge win like that especially a stoppage first round stoppage so good on henry corrales and his people for uh you know working with goes to get them on that was a, that was a really really great booking there yeah definitely um he seems like an awkward spot but i know kind of we're in this weird pocket so actually maybe it's a perfect spot i wanted to give a, a quick listener shout out and uh uh that i had i had from yesterday uh guys uh, i guess a chris was was uh messaging you he wanted me to tell you he said hi and he came by on friday i was doing uh some post show uh some post-show duties and chris and johanna uh, listeners of the show they're from uh the pacific northwest i guess they listen all the time and yeah. they, they came by uh they, they weren't able to make it i guess they, they, they said uh, you were communicating with them and you gave them the show times but they just i guess they just weren't able to make it but they wanted to let you guys know that they did try to come and they do listen to the show and i said well we'll give you guys a shout so i, I had that written down here chris and johanna oh, now it makes sense that's why you asked me to get the reservation at strip steak yeah oh okay. we're gonna hook them up gotcha but they didn't make it on time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can yeah. I do a couple? Do you have any more? Oh, no, no. Oh, that I was got, it. I just I wanted to throw that in there. Jim from St. Louis. All right. I was here the other day, and he's a friend of Michael Johnson, the fighter. Oh, he was huh. hanging out here when all the uh, cosmetologists, all the hairstyle people uh, hair people were in town. Mm -hmm. And he came over and introduced himself, says he catches the show. So, yeah, Jim from St. Louis, friend of Michael Johnson. Thanks for your support. Thanks for coming over and introducing yourself. Also, Benjamin Schatzman. I used to work at Sears with Benjamin. You remember Benjamin goes? I was going to ask you about him because we were talking about uh, Royal Rumble right. and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking if you're going to L.A., maybe. His, he, uh, uh, his him, him and his kids catch the show at 5 p.m. Uh, our time now. Oh, that's awesome. And I don't know if they're, you know, he's picking them up from school or whatever. So shout out to Lauren and Jacob Schatzman. Your father's a great guy. I worked with him like 30 years ago when we sold shoes Whoa. at Sears. Uh, one time in the uh, company All Star it game, should be with quotations that they sold shoes. <laughs> he messed his knee up, and <laughs> I had to carry that guy from uh, you know the diamond all the way to the car and <laughs> drove him to uh, Kaiser Permanente so they could fix up his knee. But he's a really, really good guy. We had some great times back there, man. Throwing that Nerf football around and whizzing by customers' ears. I mean, we used to goof. Off. I could tell you guys some great stories from <laughs> the Sears shoes days. All right, it's so the top of the hour break. Be back in about 60 seconds with the champ, 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 Ryan Bader. Stay close. Don't touch that dial. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation, Channel 93.
will be a lot better. Here are gorgeous and goes. All right, before I intro the champ, 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 let me tell you something. Back in 2008 or something like that, Ryan Bader was going to be our guest blogger on MMA Junkie, right? Mm -hmm. And I just remember going, all right, Arizona State, Russell seems like a, a solid guy to, to, to get behind in one of these things. You call it a tournament. Chael Sonnen calls it the toughest tournament in sports. But, you know, you got to make weight three times, three, four times, and you, know, you don't want to take as much damage. So I was like, yeah, I, I was always hoping our blogger did well, and, of course, he won the season. But, man, what a career this guy's had. Along the way, beat Vinny Magalias. You saw how Vinny's careers blossomed. He was in the finals there at, at, at uh, PFL. Uh, Little Nog, one of the legends from Pride. the Pride days. Quinton Jackson, former... Uh, UFC light heavyweight champ and a former Pride middleweight champ. Vladimir Matyshenko, Rafael Cavalcanti. Cavalcanti held the Strike Force light heavyweight title as well at one point. He beat King Mo, if you recall. OSP, Phil Davis, an NC2A champ, also a Bellator light heavyweight champ. Rashad Evans, a former UFC light heavyweight champ. Queen Latifah, uh, Little Nog again. Queen Latifah is really Eli Latifi. Phil Davis again, Linton Vassell, King Mo, like I mentioned, King Mo is a former strike force like heavyweight champion, and then Fedor Malianenko for crying out loud. He takes down this Grand Prix. He's the heavyweight champ. He's the light heavyweight champ. That's a that's a solid career he's had. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that that was our dude in the junkie days uh, 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 ten years ago. I mean, it's inc it's incredible the run he's been on. I was thinking about him on the way over here. Do you think it's weird on his end to get a call and people just go, hey, you want to come on our show so we could say great things about you and then you just kind of give your take on being <laughs> badass? <laughs> no. Isn't that weird? Let's check it out. Joining us now is Ryan Bader. What's up, Ryan? How you doing? What's up, guys? How you doing? Good, man. Oh, fuck, dude. What a career you had. And Saturday night had to be you know, up there on some of the many bright moments you've had in your career going against these legends. I mean... Uh, did you ever yeah. imagine that in your uh, ASU days that that this that this was what was awaiting you? No, you know we only did uh, thought I was gonna really get into MMA, um, but boy, when I got out of college, you know, I was I was going to be an athlete, but I missed it immediately. Missed the computer and all that, and uh, you know, obviously, I had friends that from that uh, ASU days on the wrestling team that came to last year at the TV. You know, they all. Uh, we're going down that path already. I was like, I'll give a shot here. Yeah, to fast forward, you know, to from there all the way to Saturday night, beating Fader, one of the greatest heavyweights ever, um, and capping off a tournament. Man, it's it's been been amazing. You know, I'm not done yet, but I mean, that's got to be. I mean, that's the pinnacle. I don't know if any night will get better than that in, in uh, my MMA career. You did it in 35 seconds. Sim, you, you did what Fedor did to Tim Silva. He hit him with a left hook as well about 10 years ago. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's just his punch. A lot of people throw left hooks, but like that, that lead left hook early in a fight that can drop someone, that that's his. Now, he also cocks the right hand, and I knew you were cognizant of that. But um, yeah. still, like, I mean, th this is just uh, looking back at your career, pretty incredible what you've been able to do. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and you, you, with him, you know, that right hand, he's obviously dangerous. He turns uh he throws those heavy hands, and we're, we're kind of willing to get in there and, and make him, almost make him fight like he fought uh, Chael. Mm -hmm. And because we, we just thought that would just benefit me, you know, just getting him tired and, and uh, um, taking him in the second round or whatever. But, you know, he, it's hard to see that right hand because he throws it from his hip, you know, but at the same time, he's exposed all the time, you know. And so uh, we, were, we were working on that push in the back. I mean, I'd say 50% of the time I was I was throwing that and timing that, um, you know, in the locker room right before I walked out. So um, it just happened to be the first punch and then it went down. You were at the Palms after you beat Elliot Marshall. and Sorry, it wasn't Elliot Marshall. It was um, Vinny. And I asked Vinny, you, yeah. I asked you uh, yeah, it was after you became the tough champion. I asked you, by the way, I go, would you ever do 185? I'm just curious. You said, hell no, that would be too much. And I never asked you this, but I have a feeling that on that night, if I would have said, "Would you ever go up to heavyweight?" You probably would have said, "Hell no, those guys are too big." I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. But but it's it's incredible how um, you know, 
the light heavyweights, like King Mo, he's a good friend of ours, and he's got like a 12 and one record at heavyweight, or or 12 and two, or something like that. He's done pretty good. It's it's amazing how uh, yep. if you got the right skill set, the the size, those extra 40 pounds just may not come into play at all. Yeah, but I think I'm, I think I'm strong enough to be with the, the big big guys, you know. And, um, obviously, quick and and I feel like I have great cardio at, at light heavyweight, let alone at heavyweight. You know, with at light heavyweight, guys a little faster, a little more agile. You know, I feel like coming up here, uh, I feel like at, at, at two or five, they're more complete fighters. You know, and obviously. Um, you know, you run into some studs everywhere, but yeah, come up here. I felt great. No, I haven't felt great. I let I I didn't actively go out and try to put a bunch of muscle on, especially for this fight um, with Fedor. He's not overly big. Um, we wanted to be able to go five rounds hard if need be. Um, you know, so I'm enjoying it. So you know, we'll see what's next. Um, get with Beltran a lot and see kind of where I go. What do you want to be next? Like, what if they go? Well, what do you want to do? What would you tell them? Um, I want to get paid. Are oh, you free agent? Yeah, uh, no, I'm getting close, so you know, and and uh, we need to do a, a new deal, and and you know, if they make me happy, and I'll I'll do whatever they want. You know, if they want me to sit heavyweight or, or whatnot. So um, that's kind of where we're at. I'm having a great time in Bellator. I got to do the you know, come over and fight in Madison Square Garden and win the belt. And then they asked me to do this heavyweight tournament. We said yes, and you know, here we are with both belts now, and it's a good time. And, and uh, you know, I want to stay here, but you know, we're going to uh, get with them and figure it out. I hope they pay you, man. You might be the Bellator goat right now. Oh, seriously, in their history, we've covered them pretty good, just like we do all the other promotions. And uh, that's quite an accomplishment that, that you've done with the two belts and, and taking down that Grand Prix that was. Equal light heavy amount of light heavyweights, heavyweights, you know, uh, young guns, old, old veterans, whatever. And and I mean, another thing is you did it so easily. Well, I mean, it, it couldn't have you know uh, gone any better, especially with it being Fedor in the finals. It just made the magnitude of the fight and the Grand Prix that much sweeter. You know, if it was Shell Simmons, you know, two two or fighters in there fighting for the heavyweight title, it wouldn't have been a sweet. But to go in there to start it off. In you know, the way they with Kimo, you know, quick knockout there, and then to to cap it off, you know, and you know, with a knockout over one of the greatest heavyweights of all time in a Grand Prix style tournament, you know, and being a two division champ, so it is a super, super special night, and and you know, I'm grateful that you know Bellator offered me to come up and, and be a part of this, and that they they put that on, you know, and it was it was fun. It wasn't. Um, I kind of said it too, but it took all like the BS out of the title shot. You know, jockeying here, having to talk shit and do all this. You know, um, best man wins, he moves on, and, and uh, until there's one guy left. Mm -hmm. Well, I think your best hand right now is at heavyweight, just because it seems like they have a clear cut number one contender fight with Vitaly Minikov in Chicago. That, and I would think the heavyweights, if you negotiate as a heavyweight, it, it probably pays better, but I don't know. Um, but you know, if you go down to two hundred five, yeah, I mean, that's there a, too. That's but you got to go away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what we're gonna get with them, and uh, um, we'll get it done. You know, but um, that's the thing. You know, I've I haven't defended the light heavyweight belt. You know, and, and there's a, there's a couple of good guys. I don't think there's a real clear cut contender. You know, um, so we'll see. We we'll, we'll need to talk about the season. We'll see. You know, defend the heavyweight belt first because, like you said, there's there are clear tech contenders. Um, with me and Kyle coming back, and he's fighting, you know, in February here, so um, that would be fun. But and there's also big fights elsewhere, too, at 205. It doesn't have to be, it could be one of those super fights with, like, a Machida or something like that. So, um, kind of, what have you guys thought about yet? Just going to enjoy this mode, but um, we'll get with them soon. I saw I saw you walk out, and Tito Ortiz kind of grabbed you, and I think that's when he told you, hey, how about a rematch? You you guys were pretty pally. I mean, it wasn't like anything confrontational or anything. But um, is, does that interest you? Like, is he – even though that fight didn't go your way, is he, like, way in the rearview mirror that, that doesn't interest you where you want to right the wrong? Or, or did that perk you up a little bit just because he is a big name and he is with Bellator? He's one of the guys you could avenge that's with Bellator. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've always wanted to get that one back. You know, and when, I, when I won the light heavyweight, you know, MSC – 
and he played Davis. Yeah, I saw him at the, the hotel lobby bar afterwards, and we kind of shot, and I was kind of kidding. I was, like, I was like, come on, man. I was like, I'll give you the, the first shot, you know, at the belt. And he's like, man, I'm done. I'm, I'm getting out. I'm retiring and whatever. But, and obviously, he came back with that shot. But, he's yeah, retired like 12 times. Where, yeah, exactly. It's one of those things where, um, you know, Bellator can justify, you know, putting him in there for a title shot, and I'm all for it. You know, like, it's kind of the same thing with the – you know, so I, I saw Chill um, you know, put his mouth a little bit, too. You know, if, if that would can justify that, then you know, for me, awesome. They're both big news. You know, be good fight, big fight. Um, so, well, yeah. The Minikoff fight would be real good. I know. I think I've heard other interviews. Well, no, I heard you at the post-fight press conference. You haven't seen much of them, but I have. Uh, and, and he's he's legit. You know, I think that'd be a great test. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I, I'm hogging up the stage here. All right, guys, goes. What do you have for Ryan Bader? Ryan, this may be the dumbest question you've ever gotten, but I was just thinking, because the fight ended so quickly, I know it's the best case scenario for you, but was there like a little piece of you that wished it would have went just a little bit more, maybe a couple exchanges here and there with him? No. Nah, <laughs> I mean, it couldn't have got any better to go yeah. out there. The whole tournament, I, I, I never got punched in the face one time. You know, so to go out there and you know, cap that off, and you get in and out, injury-free, you know, and I always take that. And you go out there and highlight real, you know, KO, Ador, you know. It's one of those things where, yeah, no, I, I didn't want to sit there and do a bunch of things with Ador. You know, we were going to be smart about it, um, you know, make him work. But, no, uh, in and out, I'll take that any day of the week. Hang on a second. One day Bader's going to have – well, he already has kids, but those kids are going to have kids. He's going to sit one of those on his lap. He's going to be talking about all, you know, his career. And, he, and one of them's going to go, you fought Fedor? Yeah, I fought him. How hard does he hit? You're not yeah. going to have an answer to that, Ryan. I mean, it would have been nice to take one on the shoulder maybe, yeah. right? Maybe not right on the chin, but just, just to take one to see how how that how hard that man is. Yeah. I, I can see. I could when I was, uh, you know, we were face-to-face there and he was clapping that right hand, I could have. I was going to also try to time him and throw a right hand and use the right hand and thought he'd be able to, to beat him there. And he was about to throw a couple of times. You could see it in his eyes. His muscles been a little tense. You know, I was like, here it comes. Here it comes the ball right now. You know? But then I ended up catching him. I was like, ooh. Get hit it out. Get out of there. You know, it's, it's surreal, you know? He's, he's obviously up there on, on everybody's list, you know? And, and, yeah, to compete against him is, is an extreme honor, and, and like I said, the magnitude of everything that was involved, you know, two, uh, two division champion, he was a heavyweight title on the line, he was capping off a tournament, you know, so it was, just, it was a great night, and uh, um, I'm glad that, you know, I could be telling his story and vice versa, you know, he's one of those guys that I was with that said, I never thought I'd be in there with him, you know, different promotions, different ages, and figured he'd either be done, and we'd never be in the same promotion. You know, so it was, it was just a, it's an amazing experience for me. You know, I had to check myself a few times, you know, fight week and all that. I said, you can't let this, don't let it be bigger than what it is. You know, don't put him on a pedestal right now. You can't after, you know, but, um, so I had to keep that running through my mind. You know, that's exactly what I was going to ask you. I know that there were moments, you, you've seen a lot of history yourself. But it is Fedor Emelianenko. It's somebody that a lot of people grew up watching, and we've seen what he does with those missiles attached to his wrist. Um, and, I, and I know you probably had those moments going into the fight, but that's what I was going to ask you was that particular moment in the fight. At any time, did you just kind of go, what the hell? This is Fedor Emelianenko. Like, did you geek out at any moment? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, there was a – when I got to the arena, um, I was getting like a little nervous right when I arrived. Rob and uh, walked in and um, got to our locker room and, and uh, Fedor and his team were kind of there. So I kind of saw him there, you know, how he is. He's kind of ice cold. Looks like he doesn't even care, you know. And, and uh, I had a bunch of people in my locker room, um, cameras and all that kind of stuff. And at that moment, like I said, I had to check myself a little bit because I was like, man, this is, a, this is a big fight, you know, and I'm fighting one of the greatest guys to ever do it. And it's not like he's going to go out there and, and gently submit me. You know, he, he brings the violence and, it's hard, and he's gonna you're gonna be in a firefight, you know, and, and we accepted that, and so that's what I thought we're gonna get into that first round was like a crazy, like him and Chel Sonnen kind of round, you know. And so, um, and there's there's other times that during the week, you know, too, when you're 
when you're uh, staring across from them and, and you're like, no, we're fighting Fedor in three days. Holy, <laughs> holy shit. Here we go, you know? Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I, I tried to, that was the whole thing. It's like I, I kept checking myself, don't put them on a pedestal, and that's what I've heard, you know, other fighters in this in, in this uh, tournament. And you kind of say also, they're like, ah, I just kind of respected him too much. Don't put him up there, you know? Um, so I knew that going in, you know, not to, not to do that. Bellator light heavyweight champion, Bellator heavyweight champion, and Bellator grand heavyweight grand prix champion Ryan Bader joining us here on the hotline. Dan, Tom, what do you have for Ryan Bader? Hey, Ryan, I'm looking at uh, your Instagram right now, and that's an awesome pic that you uh, strapped up all the kids there with belts and pose. But uh, I'm looking at the the grand uh, the, the grand prix the tournament champion belt, and that's awesome. I'm glad they gave it a kind of a different look. And even though it's more circular than, than, than square, it almost reminds me of the old uh, Pride Grand Prix Championship belts, which made me think of uh, Mark Coleman's 2000 run. That was a, another wrestler who did well and made his name in the UFC. And, and you know, a lot of people um, may have counted him out at that time of his career, but he, he went to Japan and had that, that, that what ended up being the, the, the biggest accolade and accomplishment uh, to him, obviously, you guys have different careers, Ryan. But are those par- do you, do you kind of see those parallels, or, or do you even do you even follow the MMA history like that and have, have the appreciation for those days? I definitely have appreciation, you know, and, and you know, we we all kind of have our own story, you know. And I know Colby a little bit. And, uh, I was telling the speed that he was there, you know, and it was, it was cool to just you know get in, in their minds of what was going on, how they were training, and. How much they did know and, and didn't know at the time. You know, those guys are the guys I look up to that put it all out on the line for, you know, to go out there and do what they loved. You know, there wasn't a ton of money in it, all that kind of stuff. And they're out there, you know, just, just being beasts. And, and, you know, it, it's definitely something I look up to. And there's a lot of parallels there, you know, getting into the sport, too, looking at guys like Dan Henderson with that wrestling background. You know, and there's a hard right hand. You know, um, he's kind of one of the guys that tried to model myself after when I first got in. And, and yeah, so that history and lineage there is nothing but respect for me, and that's why this fight was so big too. And like I said, being a part of Fatal's story and him being part of mine, you know, it was just one of those bucket list kind of things. No, that's awesome. Incredibly happy for you, Ryan. And to your point, yeah, you're right. Everybody does have their own story. But, but to your point about tournaments and wrestlers, it's always been, been uh, cool to see, you know, the wrestlers excel in that. Obviously, you know, even in more modern times and even within your own organization, we saw uh, Michael Chandler get to his first uh, at first uh, Bellator world title through a tournament. So th- th- they're always always great to see these stories. But I'm glad you mentioned uh, Dan Henderson because that was that was my my, my question for you, uh, Ryan. Uh, obviously, Dan Henderson, he, he spent some time uh, a couple places, but obviously ASU. And we've had this debate. Uh, we, we've pitched it to people before. I don't think we've pitched it to somebody from Arizona State University. And, uh, you know, the ASU always gets brought up. you got you, Cain Velasquez, Don Fry, Dan Henderson, Dan Severn. Um, obviously, there's other great ones, you know. Uh, John Moraga, Aaron Simpson. John Moraga, Dolly, Aaron Bubba Simpson. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's other, other great teams like, you know, Penn, Penn State's produced some. Uh, Mizzou, obviously, Askren and Chandler. Uh, Michigan's got some underrated talent. But but do, do you feel, obviously, there's some bias, but do you feel that ASU brings a strong case for number one there? I think so, you know, um, just looking at what we've done and, and you know, uh, and we're still not done, too, you know, and, and uh, you know, you have champions there, you have, you know, King Velasquez, who's probably, who I think is one of the, the best to ever do it, you know, um, and, and he's got a big fight coming up, yeah, I mean, it just, I don't know why, you know, we all came from that one school, I know a lot of uh, us in particular, you know, CD, myself, Aaron Simpson, along with all that, we were on the same team, so we... You know, we saw where the sport was kind of going, and it was getting pretty mainstream, pretty popular. It was an avenue for us to go and, and still compete and make a career out of it, you know. So, um, but to have all those guys before us, you know, come through the same deal, yeah, just, you know, I don't know why that school would be taking it, but uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure, man. What else is pretty cool is those three belts you got, uh, those three titles, those that picture that I saw in the post-fight press conference. That that was awesome to see. We're really, really happy for you, Ryan. We always consider you a junkie, and uh, congrats, man. I mean, you put in the hard work. You know, you lost to Jones and Ortiz back-to-back and shook that off. I'm telling you, sometimes fighters, they lose one, it's tough. They lose two or three, ah, oh, you know, and – and uh, but but every time there's been a setback, there's been so many more positives that come forward. So congrats on all your success. We're really really uh, happy for you, and 
Uh, I hope negotiations go well and, and you get paid because, like I said, you're you're just one of the big stars in MMA, period, not just Bellator. Yeah, I appreciate you guys and appreciate you always having my back. And it's been a lot of fun long, and not done yet. Let's go. All right, my man. Thanks for the time. That is Ryan Bader, folks. Give him a follow on Twitter at uh, Ryan Bader. He... Uh, He's one of my favorites. Remember when we used to do the lightsaber intro? Yeah. I forgot about that. Just because we saw him from, like, tough kind of grow up, you know, and uh, I'm telling you, those setbacks. Henry Corrales lost three in a row. But he lost to two, a former champ in Strauss, mm -hmm. a current champ in Frady, and who was the other one? Manuel Sanchez, I believe, right? Yep. And before that, he had won 13 straight, and then since that, he's won, like, five straight. Yep. To overcome that adversity is... It's not easy, and to overcome it and then continue and just get better, and, and that's something Bader was able to do. So I uh, I applaud him, man. Uh, imagine that, just going out there and being able to do that to, to uh, Fedor Malenko. All right, we got to take a break. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 93. Stay close. We'll be right back. Mexico, Joe Diesel Riggs will throw down against Rudo Tovar. One of the most impressive things about Diesel is of his 47 wins in mixed martial arts, he's got 42 finishes. He ain't playing around, all right? The judges rarely need to do their job when this guy gets in there because he's got cement blocks attached to his wrist. He joins us now on the hotline. What's up, Joe Riggs? How you doing, man? Good. How you doing? What's that? Uh, play out. You guys, uh, you guys are playing some whites. I guess my walk out. Yeah, like we that. we know this player. Yeah, did. <laughs> you know, is that why you did it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we. Oh, okay, I was about to say. I thought it was a clinky thing. No. Cool. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I, I got a, I got got a kind of fight coming from Mexico, and you know I love. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a pro boxer, and then uh, you know Ben Rockle was just it's found and uh, you know it's not. You know, like, uh, I, I would have rather if I uh, fought 
last weekend against um, Matt, Matt Dwyer. Um, you know, because you know that's my that's my that's what I do for a living. But you know, I, I love I love playing up boxing. You know, and I, I hurt my ankle in, in my previous fight in Michigan last month, so I wasn't able to push and kick. I, I, I push off my leg and shoot double legs and kick. So I don't. I, so I, I can pretty much just box, which is that's all it is. And so uh, you know, I'm excited. You know, I'm very really excited. But it's uh, yeah, I'm. I'm I'm looking to take uh, this motherfucker's head off for sure. <laughs> what is uh, strength and conditioning? You know, when you're working on your cardio for bare knuckle, what what do you focus on the most there uh, versus like when you train for MMA? Um, the, the, with bare knuckle, you you um you take your shots. You know, you don't want to just swing wildly and land on the head like land, you know, bone to bone in the head where you completely destroy your hand. Uh, so you, so you, you know, the, the volume of punches are lower, so, but, you know, when they land, they land cleanly. You know, people don't realize that it's more of a safe sport to make more starts, because that would be, if you give me, if you give me an option to be hit with a 10-ounce boxing glove with a, with a wrapped cast underneath it, or a 4-ounce mixed martial arts glove with a wrapped cast underneath it, or a bare knuckle, I would pick bare knuckle nine times, I mean, a hundred times out of a hundred. It's not even... It's, it's that uh, it's that explosion of that rap. It's the rap that does the most damage. Gotcha. Tell me about Rudo Tovar. That's your opponent. It's a USA versus Mexico theme. You had a chance to study this cat. What does he bring to the table? Power, speed, both, um, none of it. Um, he's got a good jab. Um, he's got a boxing background. He's got a boxing background. Um, I noticed we, I noticed he doesn't he, he doesn't come forward a lot. And uh, when he does go backwards, he doesn't have a good check hook. What's that? That's gonna that's gonna that's gonna be bad for him, you know. If when you go straight back and you don't have any, have any kind of a check hook, kinda of leaves you open for a lot of stuff. Then he fucking kinda of headbutted me at the land, which kinda of still was sitting in my car. You know, it's kinda of bothering me. Not it wasn't land, it was a press conference, so uh, he's he, he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna get a second ass with even worse for that. That's what's up. Joe Diesel Riggs, our guest here on the MMA Junkie Radio Show. He will be throwing down on Saturday night. It's Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship 4. And you can catch the fights on fight.tv. It is a pay-per-view. $29.99 gets you about 10, 12 of these fights, including Julian Lane versus Leonard Garcia, Beck Rawlings versus Cecilia Flores, Tony Lopez versus Joey Beltran, Chris Lytle. I mean, there's a lot of MMA love. On this card, including our guest Joe yeah, Riggs fighting yeah. Rudo Tovar. Yeah, goes, it's, it's, what do you have for the diesel? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a good card, man. A really good card. Yep, no doubt. Joe, you yeah, been, every time every time Chris fights, there's, there's a lot of good, lot of good, uh, lot of good matchups. Joey and uh, and Tony Lopez they had a war last time, so looking for the same kind of thing. Hey, Joe. Now we've been covering you for a very long time, and uh, you've been through a lot of stuff that we covering the sport have gone through and that's people didn't always believe in mixed martial arts and there were the stigmas that were out there now coming around full circle we see mma on espn it's grown so much with bare knuckle boxing people are yeah. even within our industry are still trying to learn a little bit about the rules and all that and i've even heard some some mma guys go like man i don't know if that's for me have you noticed some of those same stigmas that were around a few years ago for mixed martial arts? Is is bare knuckle boxing course, going through man. that I mean, right I, now? Yeah, well, you know, I live in Arizona where where John McCain pretty much put kibosh on the whole sport. So absolutely, you know, I mean, it's the same kind of thing. It's, it's uh, I was the very first mixed martial arts fighter to do bare knuckle boxing. I actually snuck down to to, to England like two years ago to have my first fight. Because I was kind of embarrassed by it because I didn't know how people would think, and then you know the, it, it got out, and then you know, more, and then after that, more and more mixed. I, I Chris called me, and then I had a bunch of friends call me, and how I liked it, and uh, it, I mean, it's really fun. You know, it's fun. It's, it's uh, you know, it's just a fun thing. You know, I mean, I, I'm a co-boxer as well, um, but this is just this is just fun. I mean, I mean. You know, it's like it's like twenty thousand dollars. It's not as much as you get from this martial arts, but I mean, it's, it's a good chunk of money. But it's still fun. It's it's, it's just uh, it's it's you only got to worry about one thing, and uh, you know, it's just it's like a hobby pretty much. And then, but you know, it's a hobby now. But maybe 
you know, in the future, I'm close to retirement, but maybe, you know, in three years, you know, when I'm training guys, I can, you know, their sport picks up and they can go do big things with it because Dave Feldman, he's, a, he's, a, he's actually a really good promoter. He's a nice guy. He doesn't try to screw people over. He, you know, like, like that one bare knuckle show, like they, they, I was going to fight Johnny Hendricks and I made that promise to my son that I was going to take him camping, so I said no, but thank God I didn't because nobody got paid. Yeah. And it's just one of those things, you know, he, whatever he does or whatever he says he's going to do, he does. Joe, in regards to your training for these matchups, uh, I, I know you got a lot of friends that still do mixed martial arts. I know you still do it. But in regards to the training, is it is it like a completely different mindset where let's just say you're focused on your bare knuckle matchup, but somebody were to say, hey, can you get on the mat and help us out today with wrestling? Like, does that throw off your whole timing? Do you have to only dedicate yourself to bare knuckle in the, no. the training camp? Or can you kind of just work on yeah, that? No, yeah, that's funny. That's funny. Honestly. Uh, t today I was, uh, I was doing I was doing – a lot of things uh, had work with uh, before I left, and uh, there were some guys that needed needed, needed some extra bodies grappling. So I just you know after I just kind of wrapped off and then did, did some did some grappling. So you know I'm a black belt, so you know it's always good to brush up on your skills. So you can't just walk away from something and go to something else. You know it's, you know the good thing, the good thing about mixed martial arts is you cover all areas. You know so. You know, I, I'll go from one thing to the next, and I enjoy every part of it. You know, I, I and I think at the end of my career, people don't people don't realize that I've I've won the Strike Force title, won the Bellator title, I've won the uh, I've won the WBC title. Um, you know, I've done a lot of things, and people, you know, um, the, the the more the the, the more I, I I keep myself active, like I've trained my I've I've changed my entire training regimen, and it's helped me. I don't sit there and and, and just, you know, abuse myself like used to, you know. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, hey, uh, we wish you the best of luck, man, on Saturday. It's going to be a fun card out there. Chris Lytle had told us about it. It sounded like a Stitch Duran's going to go down there and wrap some hands. It sounded like a cool place to catch fights. Unfortunately, it, it's the same weekend of the Super Bowl. But I know you guys will have a good time. You'll, uh, knock, you'll, you'll knock this guy out and you have some margaritas on the beach the next for the next few days. So enjoy it, Joe Diesel Riggs. Are you, are you guys going to watch? Hell, yeah, we're going to watch. Uh, well, hell yeah. Well, I got, I got, I got a short-lived career. Well, I mean, I got like probably six fights left. So uh, um, make sure you uh, keep an eye on, uh, on the last part of my career. I've, since I left the UFC, I'm like 14 one one So just keep an eye on me, and uh, I'm going to finish with a boom. So just keep an eye on me, guys. Sounds good. Thanks for the time. Thank you, buddy. All Take right. care. See you. That is Joe Riggs. We're going to take our last break. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 93. Stay close. We'll be back with Beck Rawlings, who's also on this fight card, Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship 4.
Hey, how's it going, fellas? What's up, man? Uh, I guess it's... Yes, it's happy everything, man. It's been a hot minute since I called in, so I just wanted to touch base because we got two days left in January to say Happy New Year. Uh, welcome to the prime time hours. Uh, outside of that, what's up to Jum- Jumbo Josh? He's killing it, man. I'm, I'm liking it. You know, we can't say he's uh-huh. replacing Danny, but he's definitely a good addition. I'm liking those those audio clips that you guys are pumping in there when, when you got the fighters on their, their actual clips. That's hot. Uh, how, do you, how do you think you Josh has done it. today, Pooh, man? Uh, has he been on point? Uh, you know what? I was going to send in a letter to Sirius because he put me, like, left me on hold for so long. But no, I still got love. Yeah, <laughs> he's doing great today. Yeah, he's, he's killing I'm it. so he's sorry. Killing. I love when he chimes in. So it's good stuff. Uh, what can you do? He put me on hold to, to Ryan Bader. Like, who would I be to talk about that? Yeah. That's what I guess I'm going to talk about, though. Uh, you know, this that, that was the run of Ryan Bader. 2018, end of 2018, was all Bader. You know, what a, what a rise to, to become the champ champ, like you guys said yesterday, like that is putting in some serious work, just beating winner after winner after winner, you know, just getting better every time, you know, it's a new step up in competition all the way to Fedor for the three belts. You know, that that is hats off to Bader on that. Um, and then the other thing, uh, lastly, was this, this, again, we're talking about John Jones. And uh, I don't know, you know, I, I, I kind of feel for how it went today that there's no real plan. And, in, 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 you know, with the upcoming, I, I did learn somewhere that upcoming, uh, I believe it's this year or next year, that they're going to be looking at, um, you know, within the, uh, USADA and stuff like that, that they're going to be kind of, you know, going with their next set of rules and regulations and things like that. And they didn't really speak, you know, to where they're going with this situation. Like, is this for everybody now? Anybody with picograms now gets... You know what I mean? Just some extra testing and they get to wait longer and keep fighting with their picograms. Or, you know, should they, you know, say we need to have like an emergency sitting and make some addressing here and say, okay, you know, this is what the minimum picogram allowance is and anything, you know, below that we're not even going to report on anymore. You know, they need to get somewhere with that because, you know, again, you know, they're just, is this just a John Jones thing, you know, because he's the biggest guy and he's making the most money for everybody. You know, do we just keep making allowances, or is this for everybody? You know, they should have been more clear about things like that. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for the call, Puma. Lastly, um, they gotta they gotta address that. They what they have to have is consistency because you you can't have for media to cry out, for fans to cry out. That's gonna happen in every sport. But when your own employees, other fighters, are talking about it that way, you just can't have that, man. Yeah, Puma. We'll answer a few of your other questions uh, in a few minutes. Right now, I got to get to our next guest. Her name is Beck Rollins, and just like Chris Lytle and Joe Diesel Riggs, she will be taking her talents to Cancun, Mexico on Saturday for BKFC 4. And again, you can catch the fights on Fight TV 29.95 to order it. They got a great card put together, some really, really good names. So if some of you haven't, for, if you've forgotten about Leonard Garcia, he used to have some of the most epic MMA fights. So I can only imagine him and Julian Lane's probably going to be. Uh, an awesome fight as well. So they got a lot of talent on this card. Uh, Beck Rollins fights Cecilia Flores as part of the USA vs. Mexico theme, and it's for the 125-pound World uh, Police Gazette World Diamond Belt. She joins us now on the hotline. What's up, Beck? How you doing? Hey, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, good. Welcome back to MMA Junkie Radio. Great to have you here. Uh, you've been doing really good with the uh, bare knuckle. I mean, that's that's right down your alley. I, I, I think it was tailor-made for a fighter like yourself. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I said. Um, I think it's definitely made for me. My style definitely suits it. So I've been having heaps of fun doing it and can't wait to fight on Saturday night. Um, it's been a nice camp that I've had, so it's going to be nice to punch someone in the face this Saturday. Yeah, and so I just want to ask you one question, and then we'll talk bare knuckle. But is MMA in your rearview mirror, or will you? Are you still keeping it open uh, while you do bare knuckle? Uh, I'm happy with bare knuckle right now. You know, um, this will be my first fight with them, and I'll be looking at fighting with them um, throughout this year. So while I, while they're still booking me fights, I'll stick to, to bare knuckle. But um, I haven't completely ruled out MMA. I definitely feel like I have, you know, something to prove in that sport. I kind of went out on a bad note, so I definitely don't want to leave on 
um, leave like that. So I would like to go back there and um, and show everyone how I can really fight um, in MMA. So definitely not ruled out, but for now I am 100% um, focused on bare knuckle. All right. Well, we're MMA Junkie Radio, so I had to ask that question, but let's focus on bare knuckle. On bare knuckle, <laughs> I, early, early on, I figured they might have some trouble getting out of the gate. You know, I think Wyoming was one of the first states to sanction it, Mississippi. The, a few of them are going to come along. Now you guys are going international. But as bad as bare knuckle can be in terms of how it sounds to, like, the, the casual, innocent ear, how has it been telling people you're doing bare knuckle and you being a female? It, you think it's been even tougher? Or, or have, have they been just as accepting of it the same way with the males? Um, I feel like whenever I told anyone I was a fighter, they kind of, like, get were surprised by it. Um, I, I don't know what their perception of a female fighter is, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's even more so for, for bare knuckle. When I say I fight bare knuckle boxing, mm -hmm. um, they think it's crazy, you know. It's something um, that I think a lot of people um, nowadays have forgot that that's where boxing originated, so it's kind of shocking to them. Right. Um, until I explain it to them in that sense, like, this is, like, the purest form of boxing. This is how they started boxing. Um, and then they, you know, later on down the road, they, they brought in the gloves. So, um, but, yeah, people have been accepting, accepting. It's not like they've turned their nose up at me. It's just that they're a little shocked. Right, right. And I'll tell you what. Self-admittedly, I'm one of the ones that's late to the party. I'm not a misogynist in any way, but I'll tell you this much. Just women's, women <laughs> in combat sports, I wasn't sure that it would have the success it did. But I'll tell you what, I've had a big old pie on my face because women's MMA blew up in MMA. And uh, back in the day, I used to watch Layla Ali and Christy Martin and, and a lot of female boxers. Same thing, they would steal a lot of the shows. And the other day, Beck, I went to Royal Rumble. In Phoenix, Arizona, 50,000 people, and the loudest cheers was for the Women's Royal Rumble. Ronda Rousey, uh, some, <laughs> some lady named uh, uh, or Charlotte Flair, and then what was the one that won it goes? What was her name? Becky. They just Becky. called her Becky. Becky Lynch, I think, is her Becky name. Lynch, yeah. They were going nuts for her. So guess what? My money is that you're going to be the biggest star for Bare Knuckle <laughs> FC going forward. Yeah, well, I hope so. You know, I feel like we all go out there and fight and leave it all on the line. You know, we, we don't go out there to point fight. We don't go out there um, thinking, like, trying to survive, I guess. We go out there to prove a point. Mm -hmm. And I think our fights and um, our performances, you know, prove that. And I think that's why the, the crowd gets behind us and gets so excited because they know it's not going to be a boring fight. Um, so, yeah, I'm hoping, you know, I can win the crowd over this Saturday. I think, you know, the, the last two shows that I fought on, um, I definitely feel like I was the main attraction for those, so we've got to keep the ball rolling. All right, Beck Rollins, our guest here on MMA Junkie Radio. She will be fighting on Saturday in at B BKFC, Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship 4, against Cecilia Flores. And this is for the Poli uh, Police Gazette World Diamond Belt. Goes, what do you have for Beck Rollins? Beck, I'm going to piggyback a little bit off of what George said. This looks like the happiest I've ever seen you. Um, the, the feeling with victory is it the same as the feeling with victory for mixed martial arts? Um, yeah, you know, it's it's your hard work, it's your fight camp, all the sacrifices you make leading up to that fight, and then when you win, um, it's that's the feeling that you get. So no matter what what kind of fight I'm fighting, you know, one of my first fights in the regional scene in Australia to win that fight, it felt the same way as it did when I won my first UFC fight. Um, so I don't think it matters what sport you're fighting in or what promotion you're fighting in, it feels great to get all your hard work pay off and, and get that victory at the end. So um, it's I hate winning. I hate losing, you know, like I'm a very competitive person, so losing sucks, but when you win, it's, just, um, it's an emotion you can't explain. What about the process pre-fight? In, in mixed martial arts, there's a bunch of people in your division, they tell you, you got such and such next. You kind of have an idea, roughly, of who that person is. Maybe you go back and do, let's see some footage. In bare knuckle, when they tell you, this is going to be your opponent, what are the steps from there? Do you do you try and find as much footage as you can, or is it just more about the preparation on your side? Um, yeah, it's always good to, to um, study your opponent. You, know, you just want to get a certain idea of what they're going to um, be coming at you with. Uh, my opponent that I'm facing on Saturday night has absolutely nothing online. She's a Mexican fighter, and um, I don't think she's fought on many like televised events, so it's really hard to find anything on her. So um, we're kind of going into this in the dark, but 
in saying that, even if I could find her footage and study it, it's not really going to change what I'm going to do. Um, I'm pre- prepared for any kind of fight in, in there, so um, it doesn't really matter to me. But, yeah, you, it would be nice to study them, but it's not like the the end of the world if you can't find any footage because the shit I'm doing and the shit I'm working on, I'm still going to do out there on Saturday night. It doesn't really matter what she throws at me. That's what's up. Handle your own business, right, Beck? Right. You've got to, you've got to focus on yourself, what you're going to go out there and, and do and what your game plan is, not what they're going to do. Um, I feel like I've always got all um, all aspects covered. I'm, I'm good with my attacks. I'm good with my defense. Um, and I definitely I know how to fight bare knuckle, um, especially more than these boxers. So that's definitely the edge I'm taking into, into these fights, and I think it's proving every time I fight. I don't know if you've ever been to Cancun, but it's kind of like a paradise. So, first of all, handle your business on Saturday, and then enjoy the beaches of Cancun. Enjoy the food. Uh, stay away from the water. Drinking it, you know. you got to be careful there. <laughs> and lastly, I don't know what the weather report is for Saturday, but I do know that it's chilly tonight and hot tamale. <laughs> 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 Ooh, thank God. That was a delay there. I thought, okay, I thought my jokes. Joke. All right. I thought my joke sucked joke. there, but you gave me a last-minute <laughs> laugh, so appreciate that. Hey, it's always great having you on, Beck. Good luck on Saturday, all right? Thank you so much, guys. Good talking. All right. Bye-bye. All right, that is Beck Rollins. Shout out to Josh for getting both Riggs and Rollins on. Uh, Beck can be followed on Twitter at Rowdy Beck. All right, so we're commercial free, right? We're good there. Uh, are we? Yeah, I think we're all yeah, set. We are. Let's do it. We're all set. So now we have time to do our daily debate, and do we have our last yeah. caller? We're gonna get the last caller in two. Guys, I got right one more. You got one more commercial. Oh, one more oh. commercial. Oh, holy cow! Yeah, come on, guys. All right, we, got <laughs> we do. Yeah, yeah. All right, we got it. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. And we make Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 93. We will be right back.
guard. But here we go. Today's daily debate question. What do you think of the suspensions Habib Nurmagomedov and Conor McGregor received today for their roles in the UFC 229 brawl? Here are your choices, guys. Fair to both. Khabib fair, but Conor unfair. Conor fair, but Khabib unfair. Or unfair to both. What do you think, Dan? Um, I want to do fair to both with a caveat of like fair slash somewhat don't care because let's be honest, we could pick and uh, back and forth between who started what and whatnot. I think people, I, I mean, I'm sure that the, the poll results when we get to it will will agree that people won't agree on those those middle two options. Uh, so for me, it falls on the opposite two. It's either fair or unfair for me. And I say fair because what really are we using to judge it by? I mean, I guess, you know, this is technically a sport. I'm using air quotes here. Um, and, you know, athletic commissions, uh, you know, govern our sport. And I use govern for air quotes as well. There's a lot of air quotes going around is what I'm saying. A lot of this is a dog and pony show. Um, I think unless they come in overly egregious or underly egregious, there's really not a room for a lot of us to complain. So for that reason, I'll go ahead and say fair. Goes. I think it was fair to both. I mean... You don't like it, don't start a riot, right? It's pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't it come down to that? Kind like, how of. do you feel bad for them? I don't understand. A uh, riot didn't break out, though. I mean, you know, it, it was, was pretty contained. damn it was, close, George. It was contained. It's not supposed to. Yeah. That's not on the back of your ticket. Look out for people throwing chairs or jumping out of cages. Right. You, you don't expect that. If you're bringing your kids, you don't want to have to worry about that. So, I, I, I don't feel bad for these guys. I'm sorry. It's fair. It's fair, all right. Just don't do it. I think it's Connor fair, Habib unfair. Um, I just think two fifty would have been good, or even ten percent, which is two hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand seems excessive. I feel like he made a mistake, but that's one fourth of his show up money. I don't think they're supposed to take into consideration, hey, I heard he made, you know, seven figures off the pay per view. That's none of y'all's business. It's what was here. And, uh, it, you know, like, had it turned into Galata and Bo, yeah, I could see that. But luckily, it was contained, and look, this is the fight game, and it got really, really intense, and it was a big buildup. But guess what? Everyone made a lot of money, including the fighters, the UFC, and the state of Nevada. Um, in the end, nobody was hurt. Someone could have been hurt, but nobody was hurt. So I still think 250 would have sent the message. 500, though, seemed a little excessive. So I'm going to go with that one. Now, here's how it uh, worked Two out. Minutes. 35% said Connor fair, Habib unfair. 32% said fair to both. 21% said Habib fair and Connor unfair. And 12% said unfair to both. So it was all over the place, but I still like the balance because over 1,500 votes came in. So I really love how Junkie Nation kind of put some thought into it and, you know, it, was, it spread it out. All right, there you have it, folks. There's our daily debate brought to you by the MMA Junkie Radio team. We got one quick call. They got 30 seconds if they're still on. Do we still got him, Gabby? Yeah, he's still there. Hal from Chicago, what's up, man? All we can give you is about 45 seconds, brother. I figured. Uh, hey, listen, it's uh, cool to you, and uh, my pick's on a big night. But uh, my question is about Fedor, man. This guy, ever since he's uh, fought with uh, Scott Coker, he's been and finished in five fights. One minute. Uh, five by, you know, four of those by knockout. And uh, what do you think? Here's my daily debate. I mean, what does is, what is Fedor think about Scott Coker? A, thanks for the check and the Dave and Busters. Two, you jinxed me, my career. Or three, it was in God's plan. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> All right. Later. I think he likes the money, man. Yeah. So, uh he knows it's a dangerous sport. He put an ass whooping on many people out there. Maybe now is just his time. But guess what? He got to do it in his 40s. And even though he's taking losses, 30. we all love Fedor Emelianenko. We'll never forget Fedor Emelianenko. He's still a legend. So, all right. Uh, folks, we'll do more calls tomorrow. And uh, thank you all for hanging in there with us. We really appreciate the support of Junkie Nation. Thanks to Henry Krause, Ryan Bader, Joe Riggs, Beck Rollins. Shout out to Gabby and Josh out back east handling the producing duties. Good job, Goes and Dan. I, myself, I took it to another level. I was fantastic. We are out of here. We'll see you all tomorrow with another edition of MMA Junkie Radio. Go out there and be a champion.